Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, the first of our 2024 lectures uh, and part of a continuing series in the modern concrete skyscraper. Tonight we have as our speaker David West, who is co-founder with his partner um, Stephen Hill of Hill West Architects. Uh, a firm that specializes in, but is definitely not limited to housing, uh, a practice that they, or a, a practice in a, a company that they started in 2008, after David had spent some 35 years in the world of New York architecture. Um, he was a partner, as was Stephen, for, in the Costas Candilis firm, uh, and before that at Hardy, Holzman, and Pfeiffer, uh, and also at, um, at uh, John Harding Architects. He's uh, a, an architect who studied at Berkeley uh, and has in New York spent uh, a, an enormous amount of time mastering the intricacies of, uh, of New York City zoning and variances and um, site planning. And it's uh, attributable to that, that his firm has um, accomplished uh, the planning design and execution of uh, uh, probably 50,000 units of housing across uh, New York uh, and, and beyond as well. Uh, this evening mirrors a program that we did back in November that I'll show you, and here's our series, The Modern Concrete Skyscraper, a program that we did back in November uh, with Tom Leslie, who those of you who joined um, almost any of the programs of the Skyscraper Museum over the last year or so know well. Uh, Tom is a, a a professor of art and, and an architect um, a, of architecture at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He is a specialist on Chicago and has written two wonderful books on the on the Chicago skyscraper and and its history. So back in November, he um, presented a really wonderful lecture that, if you haven't seen it, you can find on um, this page of our website called Concrete Solutions residential high-rises in Chicago, which focused on the post-war era. And um, we thought it would be a, a, a wonderful way to bring concrete back to New York to have a practitioner in New York like, like David, um, who would be able to take us um, a, a, a across uh, the decades, the post-war decades, as he plans to do in his, his talk, and then also speak to his, his own experience in designing his own projects. So I'm going to um, ask David to come onto the screen now and leave myself. He'll screen share. And then um, after David finishes, Tom uh, Leslie will join us. Uh, well, we'll join David in the discussion and I'll come back at the very end. So David, I'm gonna hand it over to you to take over um, and leave the screen. Thank you for the kind introduction, Carol. So in this presentation, I will share images and trace the evolution of high-rise residential architecture from the second half of the 20th century up to the present day. Many of the buildings were designed by my firm, Hell West, or by my prior firm, Costas, Candilas and Partners. Many are collaborations with other architects and designers and a few are noteworthy buildings by others, which I feel are helpful to fill out the story. New York City has a long tradition of high-rise housing architecture. Indeed, many of the design practitioners, builders, engineers, and other consultants who are practicing today have direct lineage to counterparts from the post-war building boom from which about a quarter of New York City's housing units date. A line can be drawn from technologies and typologies that were prevalent in those years to the designs of today. In recent decades, many famous architects from around the world have contributed to the rich tapestry of New York City housing. These architects have often partnered with firms, local firms, including mine, lending a level of sophistication to New York City housing architecture that is unmatched elsewhere in the world. By the 1950s, apartment houses began taking on a decidedly modernist character, exemplified by white brick buildings, such as Manhattan House by Gordon Bunshaft of SOM. These buildings were rigorously driven by the interior layout 
eschewing ornament and multitudinous steps and setbacks for a simple extrusion of the interior floor plan. Simultaneously, major urban renewal projects were changing large areas of the city. Typically, entire neighborhoods were cleared and transformed into superblock sites with clusters of red brick punched window buildings. Much of this was developed with public subsidy by the New York City Housing Authority, also known as NYSHA. Although it was formed in 1934, the majority of NYSHA housing was built between 1945 and 1965, fueled by the ethos of the Robert Moses urban renewal era. Similarly, federal and state funding enabled the construction of what was known as mitchell -Lama projects, such as Park West Village, designed by SOM and S.J. Keller and Sons in the late 1950s. These buildings were geared to the middle class. They shared with the NYSHA projects a function-driven form and tower-in-a-park urban design ethos. The regulatory framework at the time was a mix of outdated zoning and the New York State multiple dwelling law. The zoning was a 1916 document, which was enacted at a time when the major concern was large office buildings being constructed without regard to impact on the narrow streets of lower Manhattan. The multiple dwelling law enacted in 1929 had much more to say about the design of apartment houses. It established minimum yards, courts, and a variety of height and setback controls that gave rise to several generations of buildings representing a major portion of New York City housing stock still in use to this day. However, it was not so well suited to the types of sites and buildings that were being developed in the heady days of the post-war building boom. In 1961, New York City took the bold step of creating an entirely new zoning resolution and mapping it across the five boroughs. A key element of the new resolution was a concept called height factor zoning. Buildable floor area was tied to the size of the lot by use of the floor area ratio, otherwise known as the FAR. Incentives to maximize FAR came in the form of the height factor, a ratio of floor area to lot coverage. Depending on the zoning district, Optimum FAR was achieved within a narrow range of heights, 17 to 20 stories in an R8 zone, for example. Height and setback were controlled by sky exposure planes. Towers of unlimited height were also permitted in the higher density R9 and R10 districts. The zoning worked well for the large-scale multi-building urban renewal type developments that were the priority at the time. It worked less well for smaller sites and urban infill. Nonetheless, it has left a major mark on the urban landscape and is still in place, albeit in modified form to this day. I will speak more about zoning later in this discussion. New residential buildings began to be constructed differently. Where steel was the preferred method through the 40s and 50s, it began to be replaced by reinforced concrete. Early versions of reinforced concrete often employed both columns and beams. Beams enabled thinner slabs and thus cheaper overall construction cost. However, there were downsides. The beams interfered with headroom. They also complicated formwork. Sometime in the 50s and 60s, the flat plate construction method, which had been used in Chicago earlier in the century, began to be adopted in New York City. In this form of construction, there are no beams. The slabs serve as a diaphragm, distributing loads in all directions. Columns can be located wherever they need to be for layouts, limited only by overall span. This enabled more freedom. The elimination of beams meant formwork could be swiftly dismantled and jacked up to the next level, which could commence within a few days. The lack of beams also permitted lower overall floor heights, leading to lower costs. And perhaps most significant, concrete was inherently fireproof. Indeed, as recently as the mid-1990s, these buildings did not even require sprinklers. These developments in particular, the 1961 zoning and the flat plate structure, gave rise to the general form of high-rise housing that continues to predominate to this day. 
By the mid-1970s, the urban renewal plan building form had reached a sort of zenith. Brutalism and modernism converged, resulting in some both admired and reviled complexes, such as Waterside by Davis Brody, Tracy Towers by Paul Rudolph, and Independence Plaza by Oppenheimer, Brady, and Vogelstein. The 70s ended in urban malaise. With it, the grand publicly subsidized urban renewal development gave way to more modest market rate housing, mainly in Manhattan. Philip Birnbaum was an architect who was particularly prolific during this period. Typically, his buildings were flat plate extruded structures with simple floor plate shapes. Most of his projects were considered luxury housing by the standards of the day. Birnbaum was known for the almost ruthless efficiency of his designs, enabled to a large extent by the use of the flat plate structure and accommodating zoning. By the latter part of the 80s, tall residential buildings were flourishing in multiple Manhattan neighborhoods. The style and form developed in the 70s continued to evolve. Ribbon windows replaced simple punched windows in some of the more stylish projects. Curves and elaborate geometries became more common. Nonetheless, the buildings were typically straight extrusions, each floor stacking directly without much by way of setback. Basically, buildings sorted themselves out as condos, which were viewed as white glove and luxurious, and rentals, which were less aspirational. By this time, the basic technological building blocks of this type of architecture have become quite standardized. We've already mentioned structure. Elevator technology was already well evolved by mid-century. In the years since, the biggest change has been from geared traction to direct drive, which enables faster speeds and smoother control. HVAC took two forms. Higher end buildings generally relied on two pipe fan coil units fed by chilled water from central cooling towers and hot water from centralized boiler plants or where available city steam. Early versions lacked the ability to control individually the unit, all either heated or cooled simultaneously, giving rise to problems during the shoulder seasons, as well as to hot and cold sides of a building. Later versions, still employed today in some buildings, were known as four pipe systems and could heat or cool individually at will. The other type of system that predominated, particularly in the rental market, was the package terminal air conditioner, known as the PTAC for short. These units contained a condenser coil and could provide heating or cooling at will without reliance on a central cooling tower. Hot water was still typically provided from a central boiler for heating. The PTAC unit has a distinctive exterior louver, highly visible on the exterior, set below the sill in every room. This became one of the most obvious features on buildings starting in the 80s and were still employed until quite recently when the environmental and acoustical shortcomings of the units largely drove them out of existence. Starting around the turn of the century, water source heat pumps began to replace fan coils and more recently electric VRF units have almost entirely replaced all types of HVAC. I'll speak more about this later. In the 90s, following yet another economic downturn, a new generation of this building type appeared. The buildings became glassier and taller, but were still inherently similar. Costas Candilas was a particularly prolific architect during this period who inherited the Birnbaum legacy and took it to new heights of style and efficiency. However, there was considerable pushback against these buildings. Inspired by activist author Jane Jacobs, a sense had been building in planning circles that the tower on a park had wreaked havoc on the urban fabric. Streets that were once lined with shops and pedestrians had given way to windswept plazas and blank parking garage walls. Grand motor court entries were inviting to residents but felt exclusive to passers-by. Change was afoot. A new contextual zoning typology was developed. This replaced tall setback towers with strict height limits and mandatory street walls. The resulting buildings were strikingly different from their predecessors. 
The earliest buildings of this type were designed to a new zoning regime called housing quality. It was made available via a special permit, an arduous process requiring a public review called ULIP. It was soon replaced by a somewhat simplified set of regulations called quality housing, which was as of right and made available as an alternative to height factor zoning across all the medium and high density residential districts. It was also mandatory in the new contextual zones that were mapped across many areas beginning in the 90s and continue to be mapped to this day. This was dubbed quality housing zoning in part because it included incentives for such things as providing daylight into the corridors, clean indoor, uh, indoor recreation space for tenants and other tenant amenities. Many buildings were built at various densities using this zoning and continue to be to this day. The building at the left, the Anthem, is 20 stories tall. It would have been at least 40 stories had the same site been developed under tower regulations. The image on the right shows a new project on the Upper West Side. It shows the street walls, setbacks, and height limits characteristic of contextual zoning. Still, where permitted, height for height's sake became a thing. New York City architects had a history of practicing abroad. Emerging markets for high-rise buildings, including residential buildings, took root in the Middle and Far East. New York City architects and engineers were highly active in these markets, where a combination of bubbling economies, bravado, and competition on the world stage led to ever more daring and iconic architecture. Buildings were leapfrogging each other in height. Technologies such as high strength concrete, faster elevators, and the will to build tall for its own sake led to a new class of ever taller towers. Naturally, this had an impact back home. River Place, shown on the right, was designed by Costas Candelis for Larry Silverstein in the early 1990s. It is 40 stories and contains 921 units. Though taller and glassier than many of its predecessors, it still exemplifies the brick cavity wall, ribbon window, exposed slab, and extruded form that was standard at the time. Silver Towers on the left was designed by the same team about a dozen years later. Originally, it had been conceived as a mirror image of the brick building. A glass and metal facade and soaring twin tower form exemplify the changes in taste, technology, and economics that had taken place in a little over a decade. It is 60 stories and contains 1,360 units. A major contributor to these taller buildings was an evolution in concrete construction. Innovations such as wind tunnel testing, computer modeling, high strength concrete, and performance based codes that occurred over the course of the last several decades. By the early 2000s, the stylistic preferences of both builders and consumers of residential architecture were evolving. Unitized curtain walls, which had generally been reserved for commercial buildings, began to be employed for high-end residential buildings as well. There was often a use of accents of metal or stone to give these buildings a more residential character. By the early 2000s, land prices in Manhattan had gone through the roof. When the Mayflower Hotel, which occupied a prime site on Central Park West, came to market in 2004, it was purchased for the previously unimagined price of $400 million by a consortium led by the Zeckendorf family. They selected Robert A.M. Stern as their architect and proceeded to design a building tall enough to achieve stunning views of Central Park. This was accomplished in part by incorporating double height void floors into the base of the structure, masking this subterfuge with a conventional windowed facade. Stylistically, Stern eschewed the simple modern vocabulary that was popular at the time, opting instead for a historically inspired new classical styling rendered in Indiana limestone. It proved to be wildly popular, surpassing virtually all price records and becoming the it building of the day. This image shows Riverside South, 
a residential enclave stretching from West 59th to West 72nd streets along the West Side Highway, built above an old rail yard. The image is instructive in showing the evolution of materials and forms over a period of about 25 years. Following several failed proposals, the ultimate original planning framework was developed by SOM with significant input from local civic organizations. The forms of the buildings were meant to evoke the grand Art Deco apartment house silhouettes of Central Park West. The earliest building exteriors, roughly in the middle of the image, designed by Philip Johnson in the 1990s, are clad with relatively simple brick and punched window facades. The northern blocks to the left came next. They have increasingly large windows and stone or precast facades. Next came several buildings towards the south end of Riverside Drive South to the right, which date from 2008 up to 2015. They have shifted to glass walls accented, accented by stone and precast panels. Not all of these changes were purely taste driven. A set of urban design controls, which mandated things like facade articulation and limited transparency, expired after design of the northern buildings, enabling the glassier expressions of the southern ones. Still, the general direction of style and taste roughly tracks the build out of the site. Lastly, at the southernmost two blocks of the site is Riverside Center. The site on which Riverside Center is built was slated to be a television production studio in the original master plan. Comprising two conjoined blocks, it was ultimately rezoned to permit five residential buildings with a major public open space in the center of the block. At the time of the rezoning, there was a mandate at city planning for world-class design. My firm was teamed up with Christiane de Portsenpart to develop the master plan and lock in the entitlements. Our role included ensuring buildable shapes and floor plans, whereas CDP's role was to provide architectural sizzle and surprise. Ultimately, five separate design firms produced the buildings, with Hill West working as residential and executive architect on four of the five. The westernmost three buildings are known as Waterline Square. The building forms avoid historical reference, but are held together by the master plan and arrayed around a fantastic park designed by Matthews Nielsen. The cladding of each is a different version of unitized curtain wall. The process took about 12 years overall. Beginning in the 2010s, there was a flowering of architectural sophistication at the high end of the market. Where traditionally New York City housing development had been a homegrown affair, there was an emerging market for world-renowned architects and world-class design. Coupled with engineering advances, this resulted in a new breed of architectural high-rise. 56 Leonard Street by Swiss firm Herzog and Demiron was one of the first of this new breed of skyscraper. It is located in Tribeca, an area that was just becoming hospitable to high-end housing at the time. The extruded floor plate gradually gives way to an undulating cantilevered massing that is abstractly derived from a series of great house floor plans stacked one atop another. Although at 820 feet, it is not quite super tall, it is nonetheless the precursor of the super tall both in terms of its engineering sophistication, as well as its celebration of height and design for their own sake. At this point, I would be remiss if I didn't mention supertalls, defined as being over 300 meters tall. The logical culmination of the trend towards ever greater height and ever more stratospheric valuations is the crop of supertalls on or around 57th Street in Manhattan what's come to be known as Billionaire's Row. These are ultra sophisticated, ultra luxury buildings that sprang up at the north end of the Midtown Zoning District. Part of the rationale for the height is to offer views of Central Park. These buildings are true technological wonders. The economics of these buildings are such that while they fill a perceived niche at the highest end of the market, they are unlikely, I think, to play a major role in the greater housing ecosystem of the city.
They have, however, garnered a disproportionate share of attention. For now, I would describe them as an interesting and provocative subtype. One of the first of the supertalls was 432 Park. Designed by the late Raphael Vinoli, it rises to just under 1,400 feet. With such height come unique challenges. Perhaps chief amongst them has been resident comfort in the upper floors on account of sway due to wind. The designers of 432 Park employed several techniques to mitigate these impacts. Most fundamentally, the structure, rather than columns and flat plate diaphragms, employs a moment frame consisting of rigidly connected concrete columns and girders encircling every floor. The central core is connected to the perimeter periodically by use of massive outrigger girders. Another strategy to mitigate sway was the use of a tune mass damper in the top of the building. This is essentially a giant weight suspended from cables that acts like a pendulum to minimize and dampen sway. Tune mass dampers are relatively rare in residential buildings, but are essential in buildings of such tall height and slenderness. Another phenomenon of the 2010s was the emergence of a class of buildings meant to attract attention through iconic form. Via 57 West, designed by Bark Ingalls Group, otherwise known as BIG, at the western terminus of 57th Street in Hell's Kitchen, is one of the most recognizable of this class. A rental building containing 709 apartments, it has come to be known as the Tetrahedron. Its architect describes the form as a fresh take on the classic courtyard buildings of Europe. Others liken it to a ship's sails. Whatever the inspiration, it signifies an effort to attract residents and generate buzz in a market which had no shortage of competition. An entire crop of striking buildings sprang up around the newly opened High Line, a linear park built upon a disused rail viaduct in West Chelsea. Most of these are high-end condos. They include work by such fashionable design names as Zaha Hadid. These buildings are veritable architectural confections set amid a quasi-industrial context peppered with art galleries. The building on the right by Kerry Tamarkin and Hill West shows how the industrial heritage of the context could be channeled into sophisticated residential architecture. By the mid-2010s, developable, so, developable sites in Manhattan had dwindled. One result was a shift to relatively smaller projects on infill sites. For the most part, these buildings are condominiums. In order to command the prices necessary to justify development, it became paramount that these buildings have signature design. This was the era of the boutique condo. Style varies widely. Ramza has perfected a refined early 20th century aesthetic that has had remarkable market appeal. Other projects, such as the Dorsey at 211 West 14th Street, take a more contemporary approach. 71 Reed on the left was designed to fit comfortably into the Tribeca Historic District. What they have in common are elegant ample layouts and well-appointed amenities and interiors. Numerous examples exist all over Manhattan. However, as the scale of projects in Manhattan trended down, the slack was taken up elsewhere. For the first time in decades, large-scale market rate housing began to be developed outside of Manhattan. Initially, this was concentrated in two places, Long Island City and downtown Brooklyn. Both had in common recent rezonings at Manhattan-like densities and excellent mass transit access. New buildings sprang up everywhere, transforming these neighborhoods completely in the course of a few years. Most of these buildings are rentals geared to the Manhattan workforce. They have ever more elaborate amenities coupled with relatively small apartments. Many contain a mix of market rate and affordable housing. This was a response to a property tax abatement known as 421A. This project known as Jackson Park includes three towers and a standalone amenities pavilion. It contains 1,871 units and sits on the edge of the Sunnyside rail yard. 
The buildings themselves vary greatly in form and style. Eight Court Square on the left uses brick and metal to evoke the neighborhood. Unitized curtain walls have become increasingly economical and begin to make sense even for outer borough buildings. The building pictured on the right, Skyline Tower, is a condominium. At 778 feet, it is the tallest building in Queens. In response to market forces, as well as favorable zoning, developers began to place bets on areas of the city that had been previously neglected for housing development. These included the old financial district in downtown Manhattan, as well as the waterfronts, former industrial areas, and pretty much anywhere with good subway access. The long disused waterfronts of New York City have provided an amazing opportunity for new housing development. Zoning was written and mapped to produce new, generally lower and more contextual building forms. A style evolved that used brick, metal, glass, and concrete to evoke the industrial past of these environs. 363 and 365 Bond Street was the first major project built in the Gowanus neighborhood, which has recently been rezoned to enable more such development to come. Many of these projects are at a grand scale, featuring new roads, waterfront parks, and multiple buildings. Bankside is one such project, transforming a derelict South Bronx waterfront with seven towers containing 1,400 apartments for a mix of incomes. In terms of scale, these projects resemble some of the urban renewal projects of the 60s and 70s. They also typically involve brownfield cleanup, new infrastructure, and reconstruction of the shoreline. By necessity, they employ state-of-the-art flood resiliency strategies as well. New development has also taken root in what are sometimes described as emerging neighborhoods. This project, One Archer in Jamaica, Queens, takes advantage of Opportunity Zone funding, which provides tax deferrals to qualified projects. Jamaica is a business hub located about an hour from Midtown Manhattan. Until recently, it had seen little new development. Now, projects like this one are springing up with some regularity, spurred in part by direct access to a major Long Island Railroad station and subway access to Midtown. It is 24 stories and contains 315 apartments. Of those, 95 units, or 30%, are affordable at 130% of AMI, deemed workforce housing. New towers sprang up in downtown, in the downtown Manhattan Financial District. This image shows 130 William Street with signature design by Ajay Associates. It is a striking vertical structure nestled into the labyrinthine streetscape. Downtown Brooklyn also flourished transforming from a tired Class B business center into a sparkling new mixed-use neighborhood in the course of just a few years. This building, 11 Hoyt, created in collaboration with Studio Gang, shows off the exuberant sculptural possibilities of precast concrete. Both this project and 130 William Street were collaborations with my firm, which served as the residential architect as well as executive architect. Through all of this evolution, certain constants remain. Reinforced concrete flat place construction is the underlying structural system. The layouts generally stack and drive the design. Zoning is the biggest factor driving form and density, as well as the locations of development. I'm now going to turn to a brief discussion of planning. An axiom attributed to Louis Sullivan, form follows function, is particularly true of apartment buildings. Most residential buildings are, or should be, designed first from the layout. Typical apartment depths are in the range of 27 to 35 feet. This allows rooms to be arranged perpendicular to the exterior wall with ample space behind the rooms for kitchens, baths, and closets. Buildings want to be double loaded, meaning one 30-foot module is located on either side of a corridor. This leads to something in the 60 to 65 foot depth as ideal. There are many reasons why dimensions can vary from the ideal, 
but any deviation will result in either improperly sized units or less efficient planning. Less obvious, but no less important, is the ratio of perimeter walls to enclosed space. Efficient shapes will enclose the most usable space within the least amount of exterior wall. Efficiency is key in these buildings. Elevator stairs and corridors are generally the only non-rentable space on a floor and are highly scrutinized to be as compact as possible. Room widths drive the modulation of the plan. As noted previously, columns can be located wherever makes sense within certain span constraints. So units can be squeezed and pulled into the optimal arrangement without too much disruption. This is the beauty of flat plate. An exception to these rules is the point tower. In a point tower, units wrap the core on four sides. Point towers are highly efficient and often look nice. The big drawback is they are limited as to floor plate size. Each side must be around 90 to 105 feet. Anything much smaller or larger is impossible to lay out efficiently. Many New York City buildings do vary from these principles. This is often due to zoning requirements and site constraints or to aesthetic considerations, but these are the exceptions. This plan of 11 Hoyt shows a variation that is something of a hybrid between a double loaded building and a point tower. And these plans from 56 Leonard show a point tower variation. The unit sizes and types are carefully prescribed by marketing consultants, whose job it is to maximize the dollars per square foot. For this reason, even in high-end buildings, bedroom sizes are driven towards the minimums and every possible inefficiency is squeezed out of the circulation areas. In New York City, scissor stairs are an option for many buildings, which saves considerable space. The exterior enclosure is perhaps the most visible component of any building. Brick was the predominant cladding material post-war. By the 60s and 70s, the brick cavity wall had been developed. These walls used brick ties between an outer layer of face brick and an underlying CMU wall with a two inch cavity left between the layers. Weep holes allow moisture to escape. Jumbo brick was often used to minimize labor. Window walls are a prefabricated aluminum system spanning from slab to slab. These often use as much glass as possible to achieve a floor to ceiling glass enclosure. Unlike curtain walls, they can be erected from the interior of the building and are therefore much cheaper than a curtain wall. Both of these wall systems generally rested on the slab or on metal relieving angles attached to the slab face. They were often employed side by side in the same building. Often the slab edge was visible from the exterior. By the 2010s, with the emergence of manufacturing capabilities in China and elsewhere, curtain walls had become more competitive, albeit at the higher end of the market and began to appear on a wide range of residential buildings. Also during the 2010s, cast in place concrete became a fashionable exterior skin. These buildings have an industrial aesthetic. Unfortunately, cast in place exteriors can be very challenging. For one thing, there's no easy way to create a thermal break between the slab and the wall. All insulation has to be inboard. Furthermore, the pores have to be very carefully planned to avoid or at least control cracking and surface discoloration between pores. Precast concrete mega panels are a more pragmatic approach to use to the use of concrete on the exterior. These are huge panels, pre-glazed, delivered by truck, and hoisted into place using cranes. They allow for almost unlimited exterior sculptural expression and rapid enclosure. Other more exotic cladding materials are also being employed, including various types of panels and rain screens. However, in spite of all these developments, the humble brick wall remains the cladding of choice for a large percentage of residential buildings. Zoning has played an extraordinary role in shaping the city. 
New York is credited with having developed the first true zoning resolution, which was enacted in 1916, supposedly in response to the construction of the massive equitable building at 120 Broadway in Lower Manhattan. The building rose 38 stories with no setbacks, which generated controversy and is credited with being the impetus for the zoning resolution. Ironically, the Department of City Planning now has its offices in this building. This zoning relied on relatively simple formulas relating street width to a height limit with allowance for relatively small towers to arise above it in higher density areas. In 1929, the multiple dwelling law was enacted, which regulated housing and particularly high-rise housing. It complemented the zoning, representing the shape, uh, regulating the shape and size of courts, yards, and other matters particular to housing. This situation remained largely unchanged until in 1961, a bold new zoning resolution was enacted. The 1961 zoning divided the city into residential, commercial, and manufacturing areas with special rules for each. The residential rules with both height factor and tower zoning were geared toward the tower and a park developments that were occurring at the time of enactment. As discussed previously, contextual or quality housing zoning was added to the arsenal beginning in the 1980s. Over time, the 1961 zoning resolution evolved. New special districts were created to enable particular neighborhoods to develop differently. One of the first was the special Midtown District, which employed Waldron diagrams and similar mechanisms to guide the development of tall, massive commercial towers. At this point, there are approximately 57 special purpose districts. Guided by a forward-thinking city department of city planning and constantly being amended and refined, the zoning resolution now reaches something like 1,300 pages. It has become extraordinarily complex and unde undecipherable to the uninitiated. However, in its defense, New York City, armed with this complex set of regulations, has always permitted as of right development. Any project that can be designed to fit within these rules can be built without discretionary review. Unlike most major metropolitan areas where individual projects must generally receive design reviews and project specific approvals, New York City permits even super tall buildings to proceed as long as the Department of Buildings agrees that they are consistent with the zoning rules. It cannot be overstated how significant this land use approach has been in terms of the breadth and scale, as well as the variety of forms taken by development in the city. By my estimation, somewhere around 85% of projects employ as of right zoning. For areas where the rules don't make sense, there are other paths, such as rezoning, special permits, and variances. These projects typically take two to three years longer than an as of right project and generally involve environmental review and a complex public review process known as ULRP, which stands for Uniform Land Use Review Process. It has its place, but without the as of right path, housing production and building construction in general would be much reduced. The next big drivers of architectural form in New York City are likely to be responses to forces outside of marketing, structure, and even zoning. Climate sustainability is becoming an inexorable driver of architectural innovation. Building electrification is receiving a major push. New York City has enacted stringent new regulations over the last few years meant to wean buildings off of reliance on fossil fuels. Already, many projects are being designed with electric HVAC systems. The thinking is that as the grid becomes ever more renewable, this shift will drive down reliance on fossil fuel. Soon, all building systems will be electric. Electric buildings typically require large farms of condenser units, energy recovery units, air source heat pumps, and the like. Unlike prior systems, which relied on central plants and large cooling towers, the two new technologies are most efficient when the equipment can be spread out over large areas of the roof. 
or enclosed in full floors with ample louvers for air circulation. Changes are being made to zoning to allow a wider dispersal and greater quantity of equipment spread over a larger roof area. In recent years, some of the most innovative projects in terms of sustainability have been 100% affordable housing. Many recent projects have employed passive house techniques and certifications, often driven by funding incentives and mandates. These strategies are making inroads with market rate projects as well. Gemma Gramercy, developed by SMA Equities, is a new 20-story building in the Gramercy neighborhood, which my firm designed to gain passive house certification. It features triple glazed windows, a continuous blower door tested air barrier, and all electric systems, including energy recovery ventilation. It offers welcome sound attenuation and interior comfort to its residents on a busy Manhattan street corner. And new zoning districts are being crafted, which encourage mixed income housing and mixed use programming in an effort to correct for problems that became evident after the great urban renewal housing schemes of the middle of last century, which largely segregated residential use from other uses. This master plan, approved by the city in 2021, incorporates major retail, office use, multiple hotels, and mixed income residential into a new community on the derelict shoreline of Flushing Creek in Queens, close to LaGuardia Airport. Many of the trends I have described, reimagined existing neighborhoods, clever use of as of right zoning, elaborate amenities and open space are apparent in Olympia, a new building in Dumbo, Brooklyn. The building is situated on a triangular site adjacent to the Brooklyn Bridge approach roadway. The 1961 zoning still in place created a challenging envelope. My partner, Stephen Hill, directed the design of this project. The solution, a curvilinear sculpted sail-shaped building, required virtually every floor plan to be unique. Many units have access to ample terraces, which twist and accentuate the form of the building. A large podium, which contains parking, commercial, and community facility space, provides a platform for the building and a place for outdoor amenities, such as a swimming pool and tennis court. What might have been deterrents to development were turned into opportunities for architectural expression. The building has been extremely successful in spite of coming online during a difficult sales climate created by COVID and rising interest rates. Given all the housing that's been built over the last few decades, you would think that we have enough. Unfortunately, that's far from being the case. In fact, New York City has a housing crisis. Vacancies are low, Prices for market rate housing are at record highs and affordable housing is in short supply. The governor, Kathy Hochul, has set a goal of adding 800,000 new housing units in New York State over the next decade. Mayor Adams has stated that 500,000 of those need to be in New York City. For perspective, it helps to understand a few historical housing production statistics. Approximately two thirds of New York's housing was built before 1960, more than 60 years ago. Only one third of the housing stock has been added since 1960, about one and a quarter million units. During the 60s, production averaged about 40,000 units per year. The 70s through the 90s saw a dramatic drop off to an average of under 13,000 units per year. Of course, there were booms and bus cycles, so much of that was built in a relatively small number of years. Since 2000s, things picked up a little, back to an average of a little over 20,000 units a year. Clearly, more needs to be done. Consensus has developed around a suite of measures, including state law changes, city zoning changes, and tax and financial incentives that seem necessary to achieve anything like these goals. Unfortunately, political impasse has developed and these measures seem destined to be enacted piecemeal, if at all. Hopefully the political class will find a way to enact the measures necessary in order to jumpstart production again. In closing, 
A continuous line can be drawn from the vernacular residential architecture that came about during the post-war decades through to the modern era. High-rise housing has inherent efficiencies that make it one of the most ecologically friendly housing types. And New York City is leading the way on electrification of buildings and other sustainability measures. The technology has evolved over time, but the basic building blocks, planning, structure, mechanical systems, and so forth, still resemble those from the simpler buildings of the 1960s through 90s. There is a strong tradition in New York City of professionals who have collaborated and innovated within this framework. The need for housing continues unabated. More housing of all types serving all income levels will need to be built in order to fulfill demand as well as to serve the broader aims of housing equity and affordability. Private development has long played a major role in this process. It needs to be encouraged rather than constrained. For today, I will close by celebrating the traditions as well as the innovators that continue to push the envelope and enrich the cityscape. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. And while I briefly come on to the screen and invite uh, Tom Leslie to come on as well, there he is, um, uh, then I will quickly get off. Um, but uh, because I've already briefly introduced Tom, uh, and I want to leave as much time as possible for the uh, the partisans and experts on their respective cities to reflect on how much we can learn by the uh, comparison. So, um, David, that was a really terrific uh, um, summary and uh, canvas of New York, and thank you for leaving us with that image above of Manhattan, which is so stunning and simply makes your your mind boggles the mind, but makes the, the um, spirit soar, I think, about what a great city this is. So let me, um, so it's, it, it, Tom, it's really two, two against one, I'm afraid, in terms of uh, <laughs> Chicago, but I'm going to let you have your say in response as I leave. Sure, sure. Well, David, thank you so much. I, that was uh, a, a, a remarkable talk, uh, both for the, the breadth chronologically, but also uh, for the insight about just how many factors go into the the, the form of of one of these, I, of course, I'm thrilled uh, to hear Louis Sullivan mentioned by any New York architect. Um, and I th think that what your talk really demonstrated is that the 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 function that uh, determines the form is so kind of multifaceted uh, that that the the certainly there's the kind of profit motive of having to. Uh, earn earn off of the the land, but the 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 number of kind of entities that are negotiating, uh, whether it's you know zoning, construction, materials, um, efficiency of plans, all of those things uh, make it a much messier and I think much more interesting process than uh, simply the 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 linear form follows function that that we're so used to. We just have a couple minutes, but I, I I did want to ask because I think one of the themes uh, that Carol and I have been talking about is as we've developed the idea of the, the modern concrete skyscraper, uh, is a thought about how uh, how we we design with materials, uh, how that evolves, and I'm I'm fascinated by the fact that when you showed Manhattan House, which I think a lot of us think of as the uh, the the kind of almost fundamental post-war apartment block from which everything is kind of spread out. Um, to what extent is the is the is the technology the same uh, in 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 that building and in the the buildings that you've shown of the the 2010s and 2020s? Um, and to what extent is it different? In other words, uh, you know they are concrete, they are flat plate. We've gone back in many cases to sort of brick uh, cladding. Um, but as you pointed out, there's there's a lot that's evolved as well, and I I, I just want to give you a chance to maybe draw that through line uh, over the last sixty or seventy years and talk about both what's the same and 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 what you feel that the most important uh, changes have been. Well, look, first of all, I'm not actually sure if Manhattan House is a flat plate structure. Hmm. It may be. I was told by uh, Sylvia and Marcus, who who I consulted for structural historical uh, matters on this uh, talk. I was told that the white brick buildings typically were steel with goulash uh, 
fill, which is kind mm -hmm. of a, a lightweight concrete uh, arch built between the beams. And that kind of changed to flat plate concrete, not in one jump, but over a period of about a decade, uh, when there was a contractor named Dick Underhill, who I think either came out of Chicago or had been there and learned the technique there and came here and started promoting it actively uh, to developers in New York City. And I, I think from what Sylvia had said, the big uh, the big thing holding that transition up had been the quality of concrete, and it was uh, it was only because there was a, a concrete contractor who was willing to guarantee the quality of his concrete to be three thousand psi or whatever it was in those days that people started to stick their neck out a little and change to that system. Um, but once flat plate took hold, it became uh, pretty much universal. It, it has so many advantages and was absolutely inherent to these buildings. Uh, beyond that, uh, again, I think gradual evolution is probably a more accurate description than sudden innovation. Uh, for example, elevators, I think, have pretty much been the same basic technology for a hundred years, but they have changed in little steps over the years and become, of course, much more sophisticated now, particularly with uh, the control systems that are in place. But uh, again, I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, actually. I think uh, I drifted off topic. No, no, no. That, that, it, it, it fascinating to hear about the arrival of flat plate and, and the fact that uh, steel was used for, for so long. Uh, one of the points that I always try to make in, in talking about Chicago residential high rises is, is that as much as we all look at Mises 8688, they were just about the only steel framed uh, apartment buildings in Chicago, certainly post war. Uh, but even pre war, flat plate had been something that, that Chicago, which we always think of as a steel city, uh, had done. And, and this is um, a topic that both Carol and I, but also a, a whole uh, host of folks here, uh, uh, have sort of started a conversation like, where did this come from, and and how did it evolve, and to go from from one city uh, to another? Um, I, I think the the final point, as we're, we're just about out of time here, is to um, point out and, and maybe get your uh, thoughts on the fact that um, is it Optima, the the tower that uh, that is by the Brooklyn Bridge? Did I get the name right? Uh, Olympia. Olympia, sorry, I knew, I knew it was an O. Um, looking at the, the way that that matches the, the zoning envelope, um, it's fascinating to me when you talked about the early post-war towers, you know, you talked about the extruded floor plan. And I've always wondered if part of the rationale behind that was that it saved drafting labor, right? That it was very, very simple to just do one plan uh, and have it get repeated, whereas uh, with with the the, the newer buildings, you you have much more agility in, in how the plans develop. And I wonder if you might comment just quickly on the design tools that that you as an architect have to work within those complex zoning envelopes today. Well, look, that's a very good point. Honestly, when I started practicing in the mid '80s, it was all hand drafting, and I remember the first AutoCAD system that was introduced to our office was a very cumbersome thing that was hooked up to a drafting table with a, a parallel rule that was tied in to control the, the CAD uh, to, so that people who are used to drawing by hand could try to figure out how to <laughs> operate this thing. Um, certainly in old days, it was much too difficult to draw highly complex projects with lots of variations from floor to floor and making changes and design revisions along the way was a cumbersome process that involved things like using uh, chemicals to erase lines and creating blueprints that could be drawn over uh, sepia prints, we called them. Uh, the computer really took over in the 90s and became uh, very quickly uh, the, the only way that building designs were produced for architects anyway. Um, AutoCAD was the program that was universal. More recently, it's been taken over 
uh, there's been a movement towards three-dimensional programs. Revit is the main one now. And of course, the engineers, particularly the structural engineers, have been using three-dimensional modeling uh, for several decades at least, and it's had a huge impact on their work. And yes, the buildings are super complex now. And part of the reason for that is because it is relatively easy to make all kinds of changes and iterations uh, yeah. using the computer. Right. Better tools, better better final product, we, we, we hope. We, we hope, yeah. <laughs> so, well, David, thanks thanks so much. Uh, this is this has been uh, great this evening. And, and Carol, I'll, I'll hand it back to you to, to uh, conclude tonight. Well, um, and thanks, Tom, for your questions and um, and um, and giving us the, the the lateral context of of housing in the in the two big cities. Um, David, thank you for um, the history and explaining the um, the the volume of housing that exists in New York and the role of concrete, which was the basic premise of, uh, of this series to try to find that kind of hidden history. So the concrete is not apparent, um, except for some of those expressive moments that you that you uh, clarified and mentioned as being complex. Um, but the but um, helping us to understand as indeed you had to um, pursue with with Sylvia and Marcus and you know, structural engineers in order to understand, you know, when did these things change? These 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 questions get lost to history uh, because, well, historians don't pay attention, but practitioners don't pay enough attention to to um, explaining, to recording, and explaining the narrative. So, if we gave you the occasion to, uh, you know, become even more explicit about that tonight, I'm I'm very pleased. But what you gave to us is this volume of housing, the context. Of zoning, um, and I certainly appreciate and, and second your um, applause for as of right zoning uh, and putting that finally in your talk in the context of housing production and how important it is that the energy of the city and of developers and of, um, of the city's own incentives programs to produce housing, which is what we need and we don't have enough of. And so we thank you for your um, 50,000 units of housing. That is its own bar graph in that uh, in that history that you showed us again. So thank you um, for tonight and thank you for your work. And everybody, please join us next time. In two weeks, we have um, a talk, a book talk. We return, return to that series uh, by James Sanders about uh, Los Angeles. Um, so we're doing, uh, I guess, a three city comparison uh, to continue January. And we hope we'll continue with the concrete skyscraper in in, um, in other sessions over the course of the spring. But um, in fact, in from February on, we turn to mass timber. So um, we are um, going from steel to concrete to timber in order to try to look at the history of tall buildings through all these material expressions. So David West, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Carol. Take care, everybody. See you next time.